Hi, Chen. Oh, hey, Aaron. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, maybe should I like test the uh, this presentation? Yes, please. I made you the uh, co-host. Okay. Let's see, uh, where is uh... okay? Um, oh, share screen. Okay, screen. slide. Yep. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yeah. And can you okay, do that? Perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna play it. Yeah. Perfect. It looks good. It's good. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I I quit. Uh, and stop sharing. Do you yeah. see when you're sharing any option to do screen annotation or no? Uh, let me see. Let me try again. Screen annotation. Yeah, I see. disabled uh, that. Snow no, like for under uh, option. Ah, good. Good. Okay. That I just tried to disable. I just disable that. No, I. I didn't see the option here. New share preset stop. Um. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yeah, you can stop sharing. Let's oh, really double check that. Is it fine? But are you, I didn't. I didn't yeah. find the option for. No, I, I. I. Um. I wanted to make sure there was no option. Oh, so I see. I see. I see. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, I quit the share. I quit sharing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, one. I'm gonna be right back. One second. Okay. That I had to help my kids with their online school. Oh, okay. <laughs> Start at eight, four, right? Yeah. Your your kids are doing homeschool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see it's online now. Hi, 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 How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Good, good, good. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> I just got a positive uh, next door, next building, to our, uh, our apartment. So uh, we got it locked out. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, uh -huh. we get some get some vegetable uh, yesterday. Yeah. Uh. Oh, I see. I see Sandra. Hi, hi, Aaron. Hey, hi, hi, Sandra. Hey. Okay. Nice. Hey. nice to see you. Nice to see you too. You want to check your. Um, Sure, you want me to check the presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Can you see the slides? Uh, yeah, it looks yes. good. Okay, great. Great. And I made you all the co-hosts, good. Song, do you live in Pudong or Pushi? Pushi, Pushi. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we got lock up that next uh, week supposedly, but we got to again. So yeah, we. I don't know. It's kind of. I think what they're gonna find is that COVID is everywhere in Shanghai. <laughs> yeah. Already. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, Ari, you you living in Pudong? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so my um, compound is locked down. Okay. So um, yeah. I went to, so like we, they told us at like 8 p.m. it's gonna be locked down tomorrow at 5 a.m. 
So my yeah. wife's like, go out right now and get food, like food. get um, <laughs> dry food. So I, I went to Carrefour. It was it was crazy. It was super crowded. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. I went to get new, like the instant noodles. And then they were all sold out. And there was this one section where there was tons of it. And it was like this purple bag and like pickled cabbage. And my wife loves pickled cabbage. So I got like tons of those. And, um, and I came back and she said like, oh, I like that. But there was some report that there was some something oh, wrong with this pickled right. vegetable <laughs> so like that's why no one buys it so uh, I got it. <laughs> that's right. um, but yeah we're it's so far it's okay here we our compound is really nice and luxurious and we can walk around yeah everything. yeah mm-hmm. okay it's actually you... not full sometimes yeah for, for local local uh local um, sir look this yeah yeah so hopefully, hopefully it's okay. Yeah. Did you get enough food? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we got, I got um, bread, pasta, okay. noodles. We have vegetables. Okay. Great. Cool. Um, I think the government, our, 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 the government is sending some um, food to the, to the neighborhood, I think, and then come yeah, in the next few weeks. Services. That's what I heard. Right? Yeah. So they told us like, so they, they said like, you can't walk your dog in my compound. And then I, so I said, no, I have to walk the dog. And then, <laughs> so I was just walking the dog. And then they said, you can't yeah, walk the fine. dog. I said, I said, I'm walking the dog. And then they said, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice I, I, you. Otherwise you, you had to like, walk it for me, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did they offer you an alternative? No, it's we're strange. not allowed to walk the dog because that just that feels no. like something you would want to have an alternative plot in place for. No, yeah, <laughs> you have some rumors that uh, sometimes locked up that you can walk the dog, that but the local services they can, okay, well, we can lock up, uh, walk your dogs for you. Uh, something, uh, yeah, see, now in that the beginning, but, yeah. but I guess it's so many people locked up, it's they are they don't have enough personnel to work the all kinds of thousands of dogs. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Although that you have to move up on uh, yourself. That being said, if the like the doormen of the fancy like apartment buildings oh, yeah. in Phil- like in Rittenhouse Square can walk yeah. the dogs for like forty different old people, because um, <laughs> I swear to God, there's one guy who works in who, who's like the the concierge. He walks like I've seen him with thirty different pets at some point in time. <laughs> So if one guy can handle all of that, surely That's amazing. You know, yeah. compound and community staff could walk a few pets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very nice, very nice condo. Yeah. But we'll we'll see we'll see what happens. I think the more testing they do, the more cases they'll find everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Me. I was even looking along for like a fancy hotel in Pushi that accepts dogs that I could like go for the quarantine for the five day Pudong quarantine, go there and then come back. But yeah, it didn't it's, work. there's no way to do that because they, they, they were locked up Pushi first. Uh, two hours later, then they, they yeah. opened the Pudong. So, in case to the yeah. actually, fine, you have a nice community, you can uh, go on. Uh, uh, just yeah. all outdoor in in a community. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it's nice. Lots of green areas yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And your lab is closed. Yes, Saturday. Okay. I, I have a couple postdocs still want to work. I said Saturday cannot. Maybe they see the next week. We have maybe two weeks. Um. Oh, sorry. All right, should we get started? Yes, please. Okay, mm-hmm. great. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to a Shanghai lock quarantine lockdown edition of NeuroZoom. But so long and I will still be here to help ease the pain with some good science. Um, before we get started with today's talks, um, I wanted to mention that we'll have great, um, great talks.
talks coming next week. And uh, those talks are Franz Weber from UPenn and Lucas Solson from uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, both talking about mechanisms of sleep. So uh, please tune in for those. Okay, so, um, and, and also please let Zolong or I know if you'd like to present your work at an upcoming uh, NeuroZoom in the spring. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague at Stanford, Dr. Sundari Chetty as our first speaker. Um, she received her undergraduate degree at um, UC Berkeley, a great public school in Northern California. She then um, stayed at Berkeley for a PhD and uh, here she worked on uh, the role of the effects of stress in uh, on uh, the hippocampus and she uh, discovered that uh, stress and uh, glucocorticoid hormone um, affects uh, a response to stress by decreasing neurogenesis and compensating by an increase in um, oligodendro uh, oligodendrocyte proliferation differentiation and um, this sort of changes the way we think about uh, the role of stress on the hippocampus and the role of white matter composition she then did a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard with uh, uh, Doug Melton, and here she worked on iPS cells and came up with uh, new and unexpected ways of improving their differentiation from a pluripotent state to a differentiated state. She found things like SARC uh, inhibitor can improve this, and she even found something simple like DMSO has a profound effect on the ability to directly differentiate iPS cells. She then uh, moved back to uh, Stanford and uh, jo joined as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and has been studying um, um, mechanisms uh, using iPS cells to study neuropsychiatric diseases like autism. Um, Sundari, is your next thing still secret or can you tell everyone about it? No, no, we can tell everyone. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then just this month, she's, um, unfortunately for us, but good for Harvard, she's moved back to Harvard, where she's an assistant professor in uh, the Harvard Medical School, Department of Psychiatry, and in the Institute for Regenerative Medicine at um, Massachusetts General Hospital. So looking forward to hearing your latest, Sundari. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Zilong, for organizing this wonderful seminar series. Um, let me begin by sharing my screen. Can everyone see the screen okay? Great. Great. So as Aaron mentioned, my lab has been using human pluripotent stem cells for modeling neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorder and other neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. And one of the major ways that we've been trying to model such heterogeneous disorders like autism has been to try to identify subtypes that are associated with the syndrome um, so one particular subtype that um, many colleagues have found is that about 20% of autistic individuals tend to have brain enlargement or um, macrocephalic or megalencephalic phenotype. Um, and what they've noticed is that those with the disproportionate megalencephaly or the increased brain volume tend to have more severe behavioral and cognitive deficits relative to autistic individuals who have normal head sizes. So they have lower gains in IQ and they have lower language capabilities and they seem to be less responsive to standard therapeutic interventions relative to autistic individuals who have a normal head circumference or brain volume. And so what we've been doing in the lab is trying to understand the mechanisms leading to brain overgrowth in hopes that we might be able to better understand the molecular and cellular mechanisms, but also screen for therapeutics that could potentially be helpful for a subset of these individuals who are impacted by the disorders. So the increase in brain size has been noted to occur prior to the first clinical signs of autism. Um, and there are increases in both the gray matter and the white matter um, shown by uh, MRI and neuroimaging studies. So the changes occur at the neuronal population as well as oligodendrocytes or myelination. And so this indicates that if we could understand the mechanisms leading to the brain overgrowth, we might be able to intervene before the first clinical signs and the symptoms appear. 
And so within my lab, we've been using a few induced pluripotent stem cell models from patients who have 16P11.2 copy number variation, as well as from idiopathic individuals, um, including typically developing kids and autistic kids with either the um, disproportion of megalencephaly or with the normal, the normal head sizes. Um, and so we've been using mode genetic and idiopathic forms to try to understand the mechanisms leading to the brain overgrowth. Some of the primary areas that we've been focusing on is, um, are there uh, changes in cellular proliferation and progenitor pools that are involved early in neurodevelopment? Are there changes in cell survival, cell size, and or the elimination of cells? And today I'll be focusing mostly on our, a study where we focused on the elimination of cells. Um, in particular, we were very interested in looking at cancer-related mechanisms and whether these mechanisms would be deregulated in brain overgrowth conditions and neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. So CD47, as many of you may know, is a commonly known as a don't eat me signal. Um, it, it's uh, upregulated in a lot of tumorigenic cells, uh, allowing the tumorigenic cells to evade engulfment by microglia or macrophages. So we had hypothesized that perhaps these cancer-related mechanisms may be deregulated in syndromes where there's brain overgrowth. And so we specifically hypothesized that um, there may be an imbalance between eat me and don't eat me signals in, in these conditions. Um, so within 16P 11.2 uh, deletion syndrome, it's frequently been associated with the macrocephalic phenotype as well as um, association with autism or intellectual disability. While 16P duplication has been associated with the microcephalic or small brain. So we generated iPSCs from these individuals, um, particularly focusing on 16P deletion individuals who had a macrocephalic phenotype uh, versus 16P duplication individuals who had a normal head size to compare um, against uh, individuals who have normal brain growth. Um, within the 16P locus, there are about 29 genes that are affected in, in the deletion and the duplication syndrome. And it's been thought to be one of the most common genetic linkages to autism spectrum disorder. So we generated iPSCs from patients with the deletion syndrome who had a head circumference of about 97th percentile uh, defined as a macrocephalic phenotype and compared these individuals to control individuals who had normal head sizes, as well as 16P duplication individuals who had um, head circumference of about 50th percentile. We first um, verified that a subset of the genes within the 16P locus is indeed either upregulated in the duplication condition or uh, suppressed in the deletion APSCs. Um, relative to control individuals. We then wanted to model gray matter, and to do so, we followed a traditional uh, two-dimensional protocol um, following Lauren Studer's work where um, over a span of 12 days, the iPSCs differentiate into neural progenitor cells that express many of the common markers, including PAC6, um, that you can see here uh, at both the mRNA level as well as at the protein level um, at, at relatively uh, comparable levels across the different conditions. We then looked at whether CD47 is uh, expressed in the NPCs, and we saw that it's upregulated, specifically upregulated in the 16P uh, deletion patients who have the brain overgrowth relative to control and duplication individuals um, at the mRNA level. We also looked at this at the protein level by flow cytometry and see that cell surface expression of CD47 is also specifically upregulated in the deletion individuals who have brain overgrowth. Um, this is work that we published last year in PNAS. So we also looked at are there changes in the white matter? And in order to try to begin to model white matter changes, 
We followed a directed differentiation protocol of about 50 days to generate oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. And we looked at an early time point to see whether CD47 is deregulated in, in the differentiation. So prior to differentiation into an oligodendrocyte progenitor cell lineage, um, prior to specification, we see no difference in CD47 expression across the different conditions. However, after about 50 days, once the cells have differentiated into oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, uh, here you can see marked by O4, a cell surface OPC marker, there is significantly upregulation of CD47, specifically in the deletion individuals um, at the mRNA level, as well as at the protein level, similar to the NPCs. So then um, in, in, um, in cancer, calreticulin, which is the eat me signal, is frequently also upregulated, indicating that the cells are unhealthy and should be eliminated. So we looked at whether these eat me signals are also upregulated in the neural progenitor cells and the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. And we see that in both NPCs and OPCs, calreticulin is upregulated in the deletion syndrome relative to control and duplication patients. Um, calreticulin binds to a lectin at the cell surface. And we saw that this lectin is also upregulated in the NPCs and OPCs of the de deletion um, individuals. So this indicates that the cells are potentially unhealthy in some way and should be eliminated, however, may not be due to the predominant signal CD47. To, so to look into this further, we next looked at whether there are actually changes in phagocytosis. Um, as an initial assessment, we did a simple in vitro assay where we took the target NPCs, um, added a fluorophore dye, and co-cultured them with human macrophages labeled in green, and looked at the co-localization of, of, of the macrophages with the NPCs uh, by flow cytometry. And here you can see uh, CD45 co-expression with the NPCs is significantly suppressed, so less phagocytosis in the deletion patients relative to the control and duplication individuals. Um, uh, as many of you are aware, there are a number of uh, CD47 blocking antibodies that have been developed that help um, cancerous cells to then become eliminated or engulfed. So we uh, investigated whether treatment of the NPCs with CD47 blocking antibody would alter any of the changes in phagocytosis. And we noticed that you can significantly increase the rates of cellular elimination by pretreatment with a CD47 blocking antibody in the deletion patients. So we also looked at this in the OPCs following about 50 days of differentiation. They were co-cultured with the uh, human macrophages. And you can see, um, the suppression of the OPC uh, cellular phagocytosis in the deletion individuals. However, in the presence of the CD47 blocking antibody, those rates are reverted back to control levels. So we will next looked at whether there would be any changes in an in vivo setting. Uh, in order to do this, we took the um, NPCs that are derived in culture or the OPCs and intracerebrally injected them into NSG pup brains and looked at changes in phagocytosis about 24 hours later by the presence of CD11B and CD45 expressing cells that are co-localized with the NPCs um, uh, to look at changes in microglial engulfment. And what you can see here is a significant suppression of phagocytosis of the NPCs in the deletion individuals. Uh, if we pretreat the cells with CD47 blocking antibody prior to transplantation, those rates are increased back up to control levels. And similarly in OPCs, um, we saw a significant suppression of cellular um, phagocytosis in the deletion individuals that could be reverted back to control levels in the presence of the CD47 blocking antibody. So next we wondered, can we administer the 
blocking antibodies systemically, which would be more therapeutically relevant. So in this case, we um, transplanted the NPCs or OPCs intracerebrally, but then injected the uh, either a control IgG antibody or the CD47 uh, blocking antibody. This one is specifically in clinical trials for cancer um, and, and looked at whether there were changes in um, rates of cellular elim elimination. Um, so here specifically, you can, you can see in the deletion individuals um, that the rates of phagocytosis are increased in the presence of the HU59G4, which is the CD47 blocking antibody, um, relative to the presence of the control IgG in both NPCs and OPCs. Uh, we then also looked at the tissue sections uh, of the pup brains, um, staining for STEM121, which is a human cytoplasmic marker and looked at co-localization with IDA1 um, indicative of microglia, you can see the increased co-localization of the IDA1 cells with the, with the transplanted cells in the presence of the blocking antibody um, in both NPCs and OPCs, supporting um, that in the presence of the blocking antibody, there's increased rates of cellular elimination. So we next wondered, would this be generalizable to patient populations who have the 16P deletion syndrome but do not have a macrocephalic phenotype? Um, so are these mechanisms specific to only those who have the brain enlargement? And so to study this, we also generated iPSCs from 16P deletion patients who, who have an average head circumference of about 50th percentile and differentiated them into NPCs and looked at the changes in CD47 and cal reticulin. And you can see that um, relative to control individuals, there's no significant changes in CD47 and cal reticulin um, in these individuals who have a normal head circumference. And similarly in OPCs, um, we saw that there, there was no increase in CD47 or cal reticulin in, in the patients who have a normal head circumference. So these changes in CD47 and cal reticulin seem to be specific to the patients who have the macrocephalic or brain enlargement um, conditions. And, and to confirm, we also noted that if we treat with anti-CD47 uh, treatment, um, there's no changes in phagocytosis in these individuals who, who do not have a microcephalic phenotype. So again, the blocking antibody only works if the cells are overexpressing cal reticulin as they are in the macrocephalic phenotypes. So what this um, part of the work shows is that macrocephalic phenotypes and megalencephaly can be modeled using human iPSCs and that pathways disrupted in cancer, such as CD47 may be disrupted in neurodevelopmental disorders with brain enlargement. And, and more generally that the balance between eat me and don't eat me signals may play critical roles during neurodevelopment, um, which is beginning to gain a lot of, a um, lot more interest in the field um, including in work, um, a commentary that Rusty Gage's lab wrote on this work, uh, that, there sh that there needs to be further investigation of these eat me and don't eat me signals, particularly during early neuro neurodevelopment in playing critical roles. Um, so some of the work that we're now expanding into is looking at whether the, there are different CD47 isoform expression in NPCs and OPCs. And we are seeing um, that there are particular isoforms that are upregulated in the deletion individuals with brain overgrowth. We've been very interested in looking at and validating these effects in post-mortem brain tissue. Um, and one of the challenges we've faced is that a lot of the brain banks don't have the clinical data tagged with the tissue of whether the brain is from a macrocephalic phenotype. So we're looking into other disorders where there is a macrocephalic phenotype to potentially look at whether CD47 may be um, upregulated in those conditions as well. And we've been looking into which of the 29 genes within the 16P locus may be directly regulating the CD47 pathway and or calreticulin, which could have important implications 
not only for neurodevelopment, but for cancer related um, mechanisms as well. And then in the next part of my talk, I'll briefly talk about some of the work that we've been doing in collaboration with David Amrell's group at UC Davis um, in uh, investigating these mechanisms in idiopathic forms of autism. And so in this project, what we've been doing is um, they've been studying about 300 to 400 children, both typically developing children and autistic children who have normal head circumferences or the disproportion of megalencephaly. And in our lab, we've generated IPSCs on about 50 to 60 of these individuals. Uh, and the goal has been to differentiate those IPSCs into neural progenitor cells, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, and microglia to look at changes in cellular proliferation that may be involved in brain overgrowth and also looking at cellular elimination um, with the hypothesis being that the microglia may also be defective in eliminating cells from, from these uh, conditions. And, and ultimately, we will be correlating this data back with behavioral data and clinical data, as well as brain imaging data on the same cohorts of children in hopes to get a more comprehensive understanding of the cellular and the systems level mechanisms and identify therapeutics that might be more personalized and more effective for these forms of the disorder. So as I mentioned, we've generated about 40, 50 IPSC lines from autistic individuals with the disproportion of megalencephaly, um, autistic individuals with normal size brains, typically developing subjects with megalencephaly, and then typically de developing subjects with normal size brains. And we hope to understand not only the mechanisms that lead to megalencephaly, but also those that are specific to autism with the megalencephaly. Um, while we were recruiting individuals into the study, we also initiated a pilot study um, on children who have been part of the UC Davis Mind Institute Autism Phenome Project. These are children who have been longitudinally assessed um, at the clinical and behavioral as well as neuroimaging levels from the ages of two out to about 15. Um, and we generated um, IPSCs from at least 12 of these individuals, including from the typically developing normal subjects, the autistic individuals with the normal size brains, and the autistic individuals with the disproportion of megalencephaly. Um, in some of our preliminary work, we've differentiated these cells into neural progenitor cells, as well as um, brain organoids and performed RNA sequencing on the NPCs to better understand the genes and signaling me mechanisms that may be deregulated in the conditions. So following some of the work we had done in our 16P um, work, we differentiated the IPSCs in, into NPCs following the two-dimensional protocol um, and found that several uh, neural progenitor cells, specific markers, including SOX1 and Nestin are comparable and, and equally expressed across the different conditions, as well as other markers such as PAC6, um, indicative of a cortical NPC marker. We then performed RNA sequencing on these NPCs and found that much of the variation is explained by the treatment or the condition. So you can see a nice segregation of the autistic individuals with normal size brains, um, the typically developing individuals and the autistic individuals with the disproportion of megalencephaly. And if we look at the genes that are impacted, about 1,000 to 3,000 genes are differentially expressed across the different conditions. Um, if we do gene ontology um, and enrichment analysis, we find many of the pathways that are associated with regulation of the cell cycle, uh, cell division, um, and also a lot of pathways associated with neuroimmune signaling seem to be impacted. One particular gene that really caught our interest um, that is specifically upregulated in the autistic individuals with disproportionate megalencephaly is CD99 and a related protein called CD99P1. And what's interesting about this gene is that it's been implicated in, in cancer similar to CD47. So it's specifically been uh, associated with leukemia 
and many monoclonal antibodies have been developed against CD99 that allowed the um, cancerous cells to become uh, eliminated in, in, in the cancer setting. Um, so, so we also looked at whether CD99 may be upregulated in cerebral organoids. Uh, so we took these IPSC lines, a subset of them, from the typically developing subjects and the autistic individuals with the normal size brain or the disproportionate megalencephaly. And you can see that out to about 23 days and out to 40 days, there's significant upregulation of CD99 in the autistic individuals with the disproportionate megalencephaly in these cerebral brain organoids. Uh, if we do a weighted gene co-expression network analysis, we find many genes and modules that are specifically upregulated or downregulated in autism with the disproportionate megalencephaly, um, and including uh, one network where CD99 is included. So across uh, many different strategies, we seem to be converging upon CD99 being important for autistic individuals with the disproportionate megalencephaly. Um, and if we look at some of the pathways and genes that seem to be affected, again, with WGCNA analysis, we see regulation of the cell cycle, cell division, as well as um, pathways associated with cancer. Uh, we've done some preliminary assessment to look at whether there are changes in cell proliferation. So for this, we used a simple MTT assay to look at the metabolic activity. Um, as an indicator of cell viability and cell proliferation. And in just preliminary work, we see trends towards um, increased cell proliferation in the NPCs in the disproportionate megalencephaly phenotype. Um, other modules that seem to be very interesting also that are unique to the autism with the normal size brain, but are suppressed in autism with disproportionate megalencephaly include P53 signaling, um, regulation of program cell death, uh, also protein localization. So it, it seems like there are pathways that are associated with uh, especially cell death and apoptosis that seem to be more um, prominent in the autism with the normal size brains but are suppressed in, in the megalencephaly phenotype. So based on this preliminary work, we are beginning to see an important role for cell cycle regulation and increased cell proliferation in autism with uh, disproportionate megalencephaly, including cancer-related pathways such as CD99, and the positive regulation of programmed cell death and apoptosis that seems to be specific to autistic individuals with the normal head sizes, but suppressed in autistic individuals with disproportionate megalencephaly. So some of the next steps that the lab is continuing on is to look at further assessment and confirmation of the changes in cell proliferation in uh, autism with disproportionate megalencephaly, um, an assessment of apoptosis, uh, especially whether there's increased apoptosis in the autism with the normal um, head sizes, and whether autism with disproportionate megalencephaly, whether those cells may be more resilient to cellular stress and DNA damage, potentially leading to the brain overgrowth. Um, so are the ASDDM cells unhealthy but not getting eliminated? And we have preliminary evidence for that where we took the target NPCs and co-cultured them in in vitro setting with human macrophages similar to our 16P11.2 copy number variation study, and see trends toward a decreased cellular phagocytosis in the autism with the disproportionate megalencephaly. So some of the work that we're continuing on is to further investigate the functional role of CD99 and look at whether treatment with monoclonal antibodies against CD99 help revert any of these specs, whether it's associated with cellular elimination and look at other cell types as well, primarily the OPCs um, for investigation of white matter. And there are CD99 knockout mice 
um, and that some of our collaborators have. So we're in, interested in investigating whether brain size may be affected in those, in those mice as well. And ultimately, the lab is very interested in identifying these sig signaling mechanisms to, to correlate our cellular data with behavioral and brain imaging data in hopes of finding more targeted and effective therapeutics um, that we could test in, in behavioral models, especially in mouse or primate models in the long run. Um, and, and also correlating our changes or cellular changes with postmortem brain samples, especially from patients who may have a macrocephalic phenotype. And ultimately, we hope to identify therapeutic targets such as CD47 or CD99 for the treatment of these disorders by understanding these mechanisms. Uh, so with that, I'll thank my laboratory. A lot of the work was done by two postdocs, um, Jingling Li and Thomas Berkler did all of the 16P work, as well as um, Allison Benuelas, who is a PhD student in our Wiseman's lab, um, and our collaborators both in the, in the Wiseman lab, as well as Stanford Psychiatry and the UC Davis Mind Institute have been very informative. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, I'm sad to lead Stanford, um, but the lab is currently moving to MGH and Harvard Medical School. So we're recruiting postdoctoral fellows, students and research staff. Um, so thank you, thank you for your attention. Great talk, Sundari. Uh, Hong Yan, do you want to start? Yeah, really nice talk. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, uh, have you, uh, can you um, model the um, uh, 16P deletion in organoids and then use uh, and then uh, deplete CD47 to do a rescue? Yeah, that's to a, see that's whether the yeah phenotype can be reversed. That's a that's a great question. Um, we haven't done that study yet. But we can uh, grow cerebral organoids from the patient samples from the patient ITSCs. Uh, we've been doing that in the autistic individuals with a disproportion of megalencephaly, but it also works in the 16P deletion individuals. And it's a great question. We haven't tried um, uh, overexpressing and knocking out CD47 yet, but it's, in the, it's been in the works in the lab. Another quick question is that in 16P deletion, um, will the elimination of neurons also being affected? So besides MPC, OPC, what about neurons elimination? Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's a great question. So we've done some preliminary work where we've taken the NPCs out to cortical neurons, and we see an increase in CD47 in, in the 16P deletion individuals in the cortical neurons as well. So it, it does seem to persist to, to the later stages. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sundari, so you showed that the CD47 antibody didn't rescue the 16P11.2 um, cells with, or without the without or the macrocephaly. Without, without the macrocephaly. I wonder if it can rescue other macrocephalies without yeah. that are caused by other things, not 16P11.2. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's something that we're interested in looking at, um, especially in there are other genetic syndromes where it's associated with brain overgrowth and neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, including P10 mutation and CHD8. And we're just beginning some of that work to see if these mechanisms translate towards other, other conditions as well, where there's macrocephalic phenotype. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, Junyi. Yeah, great talk. Uh, you actually just mentioned the answer that I have to, for the question that I have, because I know P10 is a risk factor for autism. So I wonder whether you uh, saw P10, uh, autism patient with P10 uh, change associated with macrocephaly. Yeah, we, we haven't investigated this yet, but we do plan to look at P10 mutations. And, and in our idiopathic um, cohorts of children, we, we don't have any, any individuals with the P10 mutation there. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, great talks. And all right, good luck at Harvard. You'll need it. <laughs> and um, 
Um, Zalon, do you want to introduce, um, no, just because Harvard's a tough place, but it's a great environment. But um, um, sure. Zalon, do you want to introduce John? Yeah, yeah. Sure, so Sandra, I will put my question on the chat board. So it's different questions at times. Uh, so it's my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Chen Li, who is the, uh, uh, the combo with Xia Jing, the speaker last week. Uh, so they went to the same college, USTC. They went to the same graduate school, uh, there's SIBCB and Shanghai Institute of Industry. And after the PhD, uh, postdoc, uh, PhD, they went to the same uh, university, but postdoc, uh, and have a so uh, Chen, the study is the uh, factory, uh, uh, factory uh, receptor signaling with Stephen, uh, Steve, uh, uh, Steve Lambert. So uh, after, uh, also they come back to China at the same time. So Chen started his own lab in Shanghai Jotun University School of Medicine, where uh, she started his, uh, continued working on the uh, particular molecular uh, function and the evolution of our factory receptor gene families. Uh, where he has uh, some very interesting discoveries. Uh, so today we're happy to uh, uh, has the chance to bring us his latest this development of olfactory sensor neuron uh, subpopulations. Okay, welcome, Chen. Okay, then uh, slideshow. Okay, take it away. Hey, arm yourself. Hi, hi, Chen. You just arm yourself. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. Can okay, you hear me? Great. I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. And I want to thank you and Aaron for organizing uh, NeuroZoom, uh, such a fantastic uh, seminar series. And I'm also very grateful for having the opportunity to uh, present our recent findings on mechanisms regulating development of uh, olfactory sensor neuron subpopulations. Uh, okay. Let me change my uh, point to. Laser. Okay. Is that, is that clear? All right. Looks good. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, as a start, I will briefly introduce the uh, organization of the rodent uh, main olfactory system. So, the odorants uh, can be recognized by olfactory sensor neurons or OSNs located in the olfactory epithelium, who send the axons to synapse with martial autophagy cells in the olfactory bar. And the martial tufted cells then transmit the odor uh, information into higher brain regions, generating uh, olfactory sensation. So if we zoom in on the periphery or, uh, main olfactory epithelium, we find out that the olfactory receptor proteins are localized in the cilia of olfactory sensor neurons or OSNs, where they can uh, directly bind into odorants that are dissolved in the um, nasal mucus. And uh, so the Expression of olfactory receptors are very critical for, uh, for odorant recognition in olfactory sensor neurons. Besides, the olfactory, sensor, olfactory receptors plays an uh, instructive role in targeting of axons of OSNs to the specific locations in the olfactory bulb. Therefore, the correct expression of olfactory receptor genes is, uh, ensures the precise translation of odor information into the brain. And in the main olfactory epithelium, the olfactory receptors are mainly composed of two uh, families of um, G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs. So one is odor receptor, OR, and the other is trace amine associated receptors or TARS. And also, some OSNs do express other types of olfactory receptors that are not GPCRs, such as uh, MS4As. And since uh, olfactory receptor genes are the main uh, differentially expressed genes in olfactory sensor neurons or OSNs, the OSN subpopulations can be determined by the expressed olfactory receptor families. So the main uh, OSN subpopulations can detect specific odorants and project to distinct um, or, um, olfactory bulb demands and mediate different olfactory um, animal behaviors. And the ORs can be further classified into class one and class two ORs. And the class one OR OSNs, they are mainly mediate aversion to carboxylic um, acids. And class two OR OSNs, uh, marked by red here, uh, mediate can recognize various kinds of chemical com compounds and can mediate various olfactory behaviors. Uh, 
while the tar or essence subpopulations can mediate uh, animal innate behaviors to aiming molecules. And since we are uh, specifically interested in uh, the function and development of the tar OSN subpopulations, so I will introduce a bit more on TARS. So TARS was found as a second family of olfactory receptors in uh, 2006 by, uh, St by Stephen Liblis, my postdoc mentor. And the TARS are distantly related to biogenic amine receptors such as dopamine and serotonin receptors. And there are 15 functional TARS in mouse, 17 rats, and 60 human, and a large expansion of 108 in zebrafish. And all the mammalian TARS are clustered in a single chromosome forming this uh, TAR gene cluster. And the TARS uh, likely emerged after the divergence of jaw and the jawless vertebrates. And the TARS are highly, and they are highly expressed in the main or fetch epithelium, except TAR1 that is expressed in the brain. And so far, uh, half of the, around half of the mammalian or fetch TARS have been delphinized. And they can, mammalian TARS can be a group, can be clustered in two groups based on whether they can detect the primary or tertiary amines. And some of these uh, TAR ligands are produced by amino acid decarboxylation. And also some of the TAR ligands are ecological odors that can elicit uh, innate animal behaviors. So in rodents, the TAR5 ligand trimethylamine is a species and sex specific uh, mouse urine odor that attracts mice. And while the TAR4 ligand 2 phenylacetylamine is a predator odor that repels mouse. And in zebrafish, the TAR13C uh, member can recognize uh, carrying odor such as cadaverine and repels, uh, that repels uh, zebrafish. And it's in silamprey, a sperming in semen of male animals can activate a TAR like receptor and acts as a sex pheromone to attract ovulatory female. So decades of research have revealed distinct function of the olfactory OSN subpopulations. However, it's still unclear how different OSN subpopulations are developed. That is what factors control the transcription of distinct olfactory receptor families. So we uh, use the TAR olfactory subsystem as a model to answer this question taking advantage of the relatively small number of uh, receptor members in this um, in TARS. So uh, previous studies in uh, Lombardas group and others have revealed an epigenetic regulatory mechanism for OR gene expression. So the OR genes are scattered in uh, different uh, chromosomes uh, forming this uh, TAR, uh, sorry, OR uh, gene cluster. And in the nucleus, the OR gene clusters can interact to form these inhibitory aggregates so that all of the OR genes are silenced in the beginning at this um, neuron progenitor stage, OSN progenitor stage. So when OSNs mature, the expressed or uh, the OR gene can escape from this inhibitory environment and can, is activated with the help of this so called uh, enhanced harp. And this enhancer harp is formed by uh, 63 OR enhancers, also called uh, Greek islands, that are nearby this uh, OR gene cluster. And so the OR, and also they can form this uh, ex uh, uh, ex uh, activation factory to activate the expressed OR genes. However, it's still unclear, or it's, it's still, it's, it's not, it's unknown whether TAR OSN subpopulations have the distinct enhancers and whether these enhancers can regulate, specifically regulate TAR genes instead of OR genes. So first thing, in, uh, in order to access, uh, the genetically access this uh, TAR OSNs, so we generated the TAR5 and TAR6 iris Cree mouse lines, and each Cree line was crossed to the Cree dependent report lines, including uh, LOX ZS Green and LOX L10 GFP to fluorescently label those uh, spice uh, neurons subpopulations. So next to um, dissect the regulatory elements of uh, in tar essence, so we performed ataxic to assay regions of open chromatin, including promoters, enhancers, and insulators in tar essence sorted from the tar five iris cream and tar six iris cream mice. And so, and as a controller, we use um, 
uh, OMPR CFP to sort the all mature OSNs uh, that are mainly composed of OR OSNs. And OMP is a marker for uh, mature, or, mature OSNs. And uh, we eventually we obtained six uh, replicates of TAR OSN samples and three replicates of OMP positive uh, mature OSN samples for ataxic. And by uh, quantitatively uh, an analysis, an analysis of the uh, differential ataxic peaks, so we identified in total 6,000 uh, differential peaks with uh, around 3,000 peaks in OMP uh, OS positive OSNs and 2,800 peaks enriched in TAR OSNs. And next, we are specifically interested in the, those two population specific uh, ataxic peaks around the genome uh, regions in, uh, of the TAR gene cluster. And so we found two um, uh, peaks that are specifically enriched in TAR OSNs, the six replicates here, and the up three uh, replicates of OMP positive mature OSNs. So um, indicating that those two uh, peaks might represent the potential enhancers that are important to important for regulating uh, TAR receptor gene expression. So we termed these sequences, two sequences, as uh, TAR enhancer one and TAR enhancer two. So TAR enhancer one is positioned between TAR one and TAR two, and TAR enhancer two is located between TAR six and TAR seven a. And a uh, quantitative analysis of the ataxic peaks revealed about six-fold and four-fold increase for uh, those two enhancers in TAR OSNs compared to uh, the OMP positive OSNs. And next, so we uh, will also check the chromatin accessibility of the previously identified 63 OR enhancers. So unexpectedly, we found that the, all of the 63 OR enhancers are also uh, open in TAR OSNs compared to uh, the uh, OMP positive uh, mature OSNs. And the, the uh, ataxic peaks are uh, in positive correlation in TAR OSNs and OMP positive OSNs. So these results suggest that uh, the coexistence existence of the TAR putative TAR enhancers and OI enhancers in TAR OSNs uh, strongly suggests that they may form an enhancer harp to facilitate the TAR gene expression. So to summarize this part, we found two putative TAR enhancers uh, using ataxic on enriched TAR OSNs. And those uh, two putative TAR enhancers are uh, conserved in mouse, rat, and human and show uh, similar genomic positions in the genome, or in the TAR gene cluster. And to gain, uh, to identify the uh, evolutionary origin of the two TAR enhancers, we next searched the um, the publicly available genome databases with the sequence of these two, two TAR enhancers. And we found that uh, the two TAR enhancers, we, we, are able to, we were able to you know, retrieve the homology sequence from the, uh, the seria, uh, Euseria or placental mammals, but failed to retrieve any uh, homology sequences in the metaseria, or closely related metaseria or marsupial uh, mammals. And the uh, Vista plot revealed the highly conserved synteny of the TAR genes in all of the species we selected. But the tar, two TAR enhancers are only conserved in placental mammals, but not in the marsupial mammals. So here we found that the, putative, the two putative TAR enhancers are conserved in placental mammals, but not in uh, uh, marsupial mammals. Okay, so next to uh, further check the function of the two TAR enhancers, we first generated the TAR enhancer one knockout uh, mice. And then we performed RNA-seq on the main olfactory epithelium, uh, dissected from the homozygous, homozygous heterozygous, and the white type and uh, litmates. So the RNA-seq analysis revealed that there are about 14 uh, differentially expressed genes, and nine of which were TAR genes. And the eight of the TAR genes were significantly decreased in the homozygous TAR enhancer one knockout mice. And there's only one of them, the TAR7E, was upregulated 
in uh, tar enhancer were not homologized, and other tar uh, genes tended to decrease. And the tar enhancer one knockout is specific to uh, tar genes, as the genes located nearby the tar cluster, tar gene cluster, did not was not changed. And also we checked the expression uh, levels of the OR genes, and we didn't find any changes of OR genes after tar one, uh, tar enhancer one knockout. So further suggesting the specific effect of tar enhancer one on tar genes. And the decrease of uh, tar receptor genes in um, the tar OSNs could be due to altered uh, transcript levels or the altered probability of gene choice. So in the first scenario, the number of tar OSNs will not change. But in the second scenario, the uh, tar positive OSNs will decrease. So to distinguish these two possibilities, we uh, performed RNA situ analysis and quantified the cells with uh, positive MRI expression levels uh, signals. And consistent with RNA seq, uh, seq results, we found that the cells, such as cells expressing TAR2, 3, and 5 were totally abolished in TAR enhancer 1 knockout mice. And the cells expressing uh, TAR4 and TAR6 and uh, some other TARs were significantly decreased. And the decrease in the number of the TAR OSNs is in positive cor linear correlation with the MRI decrease uh, in uh, revealed by RNC analysis, suggesting that the decrease of receptor targeting choice is due to the altered or decreased um, probability of uh, targeting choice. That is uh, the second scenario is correct. We also confirmed the reduction of the TAR OSNs in TAR enhanced one knockout by its immunohistochemistry using uh, specific antibodies against TAR5 and TAR6. As a control, we did not observe any changes in um, the, uh, the changes of number of cells expressing uh, ORs, uh, two ORs, uh, also revealed by the OR antibody uh, standing. So to summarize this part, we found deletion of TAR enhancer one dramatically decreases subsets of uh, TAR OSNs. And also next to uh, investigate the function of TAR enhancer two, we also generated the TAR enhancer two single knockout mice. And also we um, performed RNA-seq and found that there are uh, about six uh, differentially expressed genes and five of which were TAR genes. And also other TAR genes tended to decrease. And again, the genes around the TAR cluster and OR genes were not changed after TAR enhancer to knockout. And also suggesting the specific effect of TAR enhancer two to on TAR genes. We also performed the in situ hybridization to confirm the RNA seq analysis, which is consistent with the RNA seq results. And also, uh, the changes of the in TAR OSN numbers is also in positive um, correlation with RNA seq uh, results. And also, suggesting that TAR enhancer 2 also regulates the probability of gene choice instead of uh, regulating the transcript expression level. Okay, so. We found that deletion of uh, either TAR enhancer 1 or TAR enhancer 2 can both dramatically decrease subsets of TAR OSNs. And so to summarize the results of the single knockout, uh, TAR enhancer uh, knockout results, we found that we found that there are three uh, major patterns. So first is um, like cells expression TAR2. Um, the, number of cells were changed in one enhancer knockout, but not changed in other uh, enhancer knockout. And the second pattern, like cells expressing TAR5, both uh, the cells expressing TAR5 were uh, totally abolished in both knockout, single knockout animals. And the third pattern is like cells expressing TAR8A or 8B. Um, the cells expressing TAR8A were, all, were both decreased in single knockouts. So this result suggests that the two enhancers might work or, or function coordinately to regulate charging expression. So the next obvious question is how about what happens after deleting both of the uh, two tar enhancers? So we generated the um, tar enhancer one and two double knockout with both enhancers deleted. And we also performed the uh, RNA-seq analysis and show that 
all of the targets was significantly decreased uh, by the RNA seq analysis. And also, we uh, performed in situ and to show that uh, all of the cells expressing the tar TARS were about a total abolished and also revealed by this uh, quantification. And as controls, uh, cells expressing ORs are not changed. So um, here we show that the two, we, we, I was just strongly suggest that the two tie enhancers can work or function coordinately to regulate the gene choice of tar genes. And this is, uh, uh, some, to summarize this part, we did it to uh, both enhancers and we found that we can completely eliminate the tar OSNs. Okay, so to uh, provide further evidence for the function of tar enhancers, um, we uh, generated the transgenic uh, mice uh, with the DNA containing the uh, one of the two tar enhancers followed by a placed upstream of the minimal promoter of HSP68 followed by the reporter genes. So we reasoned that if the tar enhancers are specific for tar gene expression, then the enhancers can specifically drive the reporter genes expressed in the tar OSNs instead of OR OSNs. So to do this, we first generated the tar enhancer one GFP mice, uh, transgenic mice. So we uh, we obtained twelve founders, and nine of which uh, exhibited robust GFP expression in subsets of OSNs. So we also generated the tar enhancer two to the tomato transgenic mice. And we have 10 to five founders, and three of which also show the, um, robust TD tomato signals in subsets of OSNs. And the aforementioned uh, loss of function experiments strongly suggest that the two tie enhancers can um, work coordinately to regulate the target expression. And these uh, transgenic mice provide another good system to further investigate this um, possibility. So we crossed tar enhancer one GFP transgenic mice with tar enhancer two t tomato transgenic mice and visualized the overlap of GFP and t tomato positive cells. And we observed around 14% of the cells co-expressed GFP and t tomato and around 16, 67% and also 18% of the cells expressed GFP or t tomato alone. And we also um, checked the uh, projection pattern of the those GFP and T tomato positive OSNs, and I found that the majority of the glomeruli were positive for GFP and T tomato, but also we can identify some glomeruli that are specific uh, positive for uh, GFP and T tomato. So, further suggesting that the two tie enhancers can um, work coordinated to regulate um, the reporter genes here. And then next, we want to check if the GFP and the TD tomato positive cells in those two transgenic mice were specific or cover like or specific uh, tar OSNs. So to do this, we performed the uh, two color in situ to uh, using the tar and OR mix probes to label the um, these subpopulations, and we found that around 80, uh, about 80% 80 of the GFP positive cells were indeed tar OSNs. And this overlap percentage dropped dramatically for OR um, subpopulations. And for uh, tar enhancer to TD tomato transgenic mice, we found that about 70% of TD tomato positive cells were also tar OSNs. And this overlap dropped dramatically for OR OSNs for less than, to less than 1%. So to the further, this further suggests that these tar, two tar enhancers are specific for, two, for tar gene expression. Okay, so uh, to summarize this part, we found transgenic expression of reporters driven by tar enhancers recapitulates tar expression pattern. So the enhancers can um, operate both in cis and in trans to regulate the downstream or uh, upstream uh, gene expression. So we wanna check if the two tie enhancers, two tie enhancers we identified can operate in cis or in trans. And to do this, we uh, generated another uh, TAR229 cluster knockout mice in which the TAR229 cluster uh, ranging from TAR2 to 29 were totally uh, deleted. 
And then we crossed this uh, because in the 229, 229 cluster not anonymized, the target enhancer 2 is deleted. So we crossed this heterozygous um, cluster not anonymized with the enhancer 1 heterozygous mice. And we can acquire four genotypes. The first is the white type, the second genotype uh, with one allele intact, and, another, and the other allele lacking target enhancer 1. And then the uh, genotype 3 with one allele attack, intact and the other allele lacking the tar, tar 2 to 9 cluster. And also the fourth genotype in which one allele lacking tar has one and the other, other allele lacking tar 2 to 9. And this is, a, uh, this is a genotype we are very interested in because if, it, if the tar has one operating this, then we will get 0% uh, of the uh, tar orthogonals in the, this uh, genotype. And we performed an in situ, and exact, that's exactly what we found. Uh, that is for suggesting that the target enhancer one operate in this. Okay, so this is our last uh, conclusion. We found uh, some uh, summary that is uh, the last conclusion. We found that target enhancer one operates in this. Okay, so this is our working model. We found that the two target enhancers can uh, specifically regulate the entire target gene repertoire and thus. Um, deter, or regulates the development of the TAR OSN subpopulations. And this is the analogy with uh, the analogy to the uh, pipe tissue, where the two TAR enhancers is alike to the uh, connection sites between the line and the pipe. And by this way, the player can control the movement of the puppet. And uh, this is what the TAR OSNs do. They can um, regulate the whole gene, the target gene repertoire um, by uh, using these two tie enhancers. Okay, so, and so uh, this is, uh, this work is uh, co-published with uh, the Thomas group, or Thomas Bozas group in uh, Northwestern University. So there are still several key questions remaining. For example, what is the master regulator? That is the hand to control this um, target gene expression. Uh, target gene expression? And the, also, what is the 3D genome structure? That is the puppet shape composed of the tar enhancer, the tar genes, and possibly other genomic elements. And so we, we are currently um, pursuing these two uh, important questions in the lab right now. Okay, so uh, with that, I want to uh, acknowledge all the people that participated in the project. And also I want to, uh, including Stephen Libelis, my postdoc mentor, uh, who is continuously supporting me, and also my uh, lab members, especially Aimei and Wenqing, who made major contributions. And also I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, including uh, Hui Yang at Institute of Neuroscience, Long Tang and Sunny Shea at Harvard University, and uh, Gilead Bernier's group at Brown University. Okay, um, thank, thanks for your attention, and I would like to take uh, any questions here. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chen, a great talk. Now, open up for questions. Now, quick question for the ATAC sequencing is very neat. So is that possible to identify uh, some other cluster uh, of factory gene cluster, the cluster one or two you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Have you um, somebody do that? Right. Um, people have people have done some part yeah. of it for class one okay, okay. origin. So they show that they also identify a specific enhancers for uh, mm -hmm. class one origins. Okay. Right. And for yes, class two, uh, or, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so someone asking is an animal, perception animal has TARS? You, you can check the chat bar. Can figure uh, out what kind bar? of animal yeah. yeah. Let me see. Help should be asking you, a particular kind of... Okay. Of... Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, I have prepared this slide. Let me um, oh. show you this. Okay. So oh. that's... So as I mentioned before, the TARS genes actually mm -hmm. uh, emerged after divergence uh, of jaw and jawless vertebrates. So mm -hmm. indeed, the marsupial mammals, they have tar genes. But interestingly, as it also showed that the tar enhancers are only conserved in, in placental mammals. So mm -hmm. there are two possibilities. So the tar genes, are, when the tar genes are expressed in uh, the marsupial mammals and also like liver fish. Uh, yeah, so we think that the possibility, there are two possibilities. The first is that they, um, probably use a distinct mechanism or, dist or other 
non-conserved um, tar enhancers to regulate tar genes in super mammals. And the second possibility is that they use they use they also use the conserved elements, but not the entire tar enhancers. They they just need some core um, binding motifs, for example, that uh, are very th these these core motifs are are conserved in marsupial mammals to regulate the tar gene expression. So, but we, are, we we don't know the answer yet. So we we we're also interested in this. We are we're we doing some experiments to to um to show whether this is correct. With which with possibilities. So is that possible by uh, actually suggesting by the, the, the evolution, evolution of the TAR enhancer is maybe by related to the function, right? So when you need to recognize yeah. some special odorant, odorant then this, this need to be the mm, Yeah, you mean the... Very, very organized way. Yeah. So you mean the, whether the TARs, you mean the receptors or the enhancers? Uh, you, you mean you have to be some enhancing hazards, otherwise you oh, will right. not yeah. be expressing in the right. organized way, right? Yes. So that yes. means you have to collect it, correlate with the, the proper function of the particular right. receptors. Right, 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 right. Right. So we don't know. Yeah, we don't know the answer yet. So we, we uh -huh. it, it's possible that oh. you know, they have distinct enhancers or other regulatory elements yeah, yeah. that we haven't identified. But yeah, that's 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 very good. That's a very good question. We we are, we are pursuing that in yeah. zebrafish. I have, I've got what, what what kind of uh an odorant is the TR recognized? Yeah. In the beginning, so, you mentioned. Right. So those are actually you know they specifically. Let me go to the so, instruction yeah, slide. It's not in a behavior, right? So right. Let me remember your first few slide. So, so the TARS mainly detect the amine. They specifically detect amine uh, molecules. That is the uh, okay. chemicals with this, um, you know, um, nitrogen group, and they can detect the primary amines and tertiary amines. Okay. These are monoamines. They can also recognize, like you know, cadaverin. Those are like diamines. They have like two mm -hmm. amino groups. Mm -hmm. Right. And also they can recognize the sperming. Sperming is like a polyamine with multiple uh, amino groups. So those, uh, the TARS specifically recognize those uh, amine molecules. And it looks like, like these amine molecules, uh, they can be produced from um, the, uh, by samples such as urine and sweaters mm -hmm. of, uh, of the animals. So for example, for example, the cadaverin, this is uh, uh, specifically enriched in like the decaying animal bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, yeah. like a dang dangerous, like, uh, you know, uh, signal. Got it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, is there any more questions? Okay, if no more questions, we'll have, I have to go out downstairs to check my NPLX COVID test. <laughs> okay. Quarantine. Uh, okay, thanks, right. Andrew, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Jen, for great talks. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks Jen. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jen. Thanks, thanks All right, bye, Senator. I'll see you all bye, next bye. week. Bye. All right, bye. see you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys.